here we are with arguably the best tag, political tag team on TV, Dr. Pia Lolomuma on the far end, and Barack Maluka, who has reminded me just now, actually, he's, he's very, uh, he, he doesn't talk very much. He is a PhD <laughs> now, so it's doctor and doctor. You know, that lizard that jumped uh, from the Iroko tree <laughs> said uh, he would praise himself if uh, people like you did not praise him. <laughs> right, yeah? yes. So the only reason I did a PhD was so that people like you can refer to me as doctor. Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comeback. But, but he should tell you that I'm the one who insisted. <laughs> oh, absolutely. He's the one who insisted that uh, I must uh, uh, do that PhD. And it took me eight years. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And well done, Dr. Ari, for encouraging him. So it's doctor and doctor. Oh, that's why I call it the best political tag team on TV. Dr. Peel, let me start with you. Hey. The presidency. Is it over now, the marriage between the president? Is, the, is it over now? Is it a foregone conclusion? Jeff, why do you invite me to flog a dead horse? <laughs> I think the evidence that is available to all and sundry indicates quite clearly uh, that uh, the president of the republic and his deputy are not reading from the same script. It is a sad reality, particularly at this moment in the history of our country, because it is important, particularly in these nascent democracies, that those who are in the upper echelon of the political ladder read from the same script, because it then gives confidence to the people. But you asked a direct question. My direct answer is, it would appear to me that they have crossed the Rubicon and burnt their boots. Hmm. Crossed the Rubicon. Dr. Barak, listen, so it happened on a weekend, the president calls in editors to State House and indirectly tells his deputy, why don't you resign, step aside? Uh, for first, uh, he shouldn't uh, have done that. If I was uh, his communications uh, advisor, uh, I would tell him that uh, as uh, president, you don't uh, call uh, uh, four, five, six uh, editors, and through them to elocute your message to your deputy president. You summon your <coughs> deputy president to State House, and you tell him that uh, I want you to resign. Now, these two, uh, however, joined uh, at the hip uh, by virtue of the constitutional arrangement that uh, we have. And I think that uh, the deputy president is having a ball. He's really feeling very nice about uh, this whole thing and uh, literally daring them to do their worst, uh, which unfortunately they are not uh, able uh, to do. So he will be dancing around them for quite some time. And you asked uh, Professor PLO whether it was uh, dead uh, between those two, the presidency was dead. Uh, the thing is that uh, this country is shipwrecked. Government is shipwrecked. The captain summons the deputy captain through proxy to tell him through proxy to step aside. But the ship is shipwrecked. The vessel is shipwrecked. It doesn't matter whether it has sunk or it is still floating. It is shipwrecked. And all that come, comes out of it is flotsam. You know, the debris mm -hmm. that comes out of a ship that is shipwrecked. Anyone who finds it can claim it. Odinga can claim it. Mudavadi can claim it. Kalonzo Msioka can claim it. No wonder they tell the deputy president to step aside. <coughs> the opposition is also shipwrecked. A functional opposition would be telling the president and his deputy that you have failed. Step aside and allow us to give the country a new government. But they are not doing that. Mm. Instead, you see them behaving as if they are also inside us in government, losing and missing the best opportunity to tell this government that uh, you have lost it. Yeah. Uh, Prof, uh, 
immediately following the president's uh, interview with the editors, um, the deputy president came back. He, you know, he, almost, he came back almost immediately and said, I'm on a mission. I can't surrender. You know, if these were light issues, we would talk about them lightly. If it was their lives that they were playing Russian roulette with, we would not care. But to the extent that their actions and inactions have implications on the lives of Kenyans, we ought to be very worried. Because what we see here is what in diplomacy would be called cyber rattling the diplomacy. The president and the deputy are daggers drawn and they are daring each other. And what that has then engendered in the running of the government is indiscipline. And that indiscipline is manifest everywhere. I, if I was speaking from a textbook standpoint, would have asked President, uh, Deputy President William Ruto to resign. But yet I understand why he does not resign. Mm. Because by continuing to serve in government, he immunizes himself from any machinations mm. that may be thought out or thought about by the presidency. So it is, is, is a matter of strategy that he chooses to remain where he is. But the question that you are not asking, which must be asked and answered, what are the implications for the nation? As we speak now, if you are speaking in Greek of old, you would say that the country is between the Sila and the Charybdis, between the rock and the hard place, between the devil and the deep blue sea. Why do I say so? You see what is happening in Laikipia, the abject abandon with which individuals or groups that are Christian bandits are running riot in that part of the world. You see your president and my president declaring a state of emergency because there is drought. You see your minister for health waxing eloquent on television telling us to keep the COVID protocols but you see the abject abandon with which the politicians ignore him without consequence. When a country is moving in that direction, it behooves us of goodwill to speak until the scales in their eyes drop and until the wax in their ears melt. But easier said than done. Mm. Very good point. Mm. Between the sea and Caribbean, you said? The sailor and the Caribdis. Yes, the, the devil in the deep blue sea. The rock and the, the hard, hard place. place oh. That is Okay, so so the frustrations, for lack of a better word, continue. Remove GSU, replace with APs. Uh, it's a game of uh, musical chairs. And the DP has uh, perfected the art of uh, turning every disadvantage into an advantage. You take away the GSU, you give him the APIS. He has a, a tea party with the APIS the next morning, and uh, it's all camaraderie. Uh, he's in fact telling you that uh, I can also do with the G4S if uh, you so desire. It's a completely different kind of uh, dispensation. And I think it is uh, likely also a factor of the reality that uh, we haven't quite come to terms with the fact that uh, we have a different constitutional dispensation. It is uh, a dispensation that uh, allows a lot of uh, latitude that uh, was not there in other constitutional dispensations before. And they are the kinds of uh, latitudes that also call for a lot of uh, responsible behavior and conduct. Because when we promulgated the Constitution of Kenya 2010, we were coming from a, a historical place. There were lessons that we had taken in history about uh, arbitrary use and abuse of power, particularly by the national uh, CEO, and we wanted to make it a, a little more difficult 
for the national CEO to behave the way they had behaved before. Um, it's a delicate balancing act mm. on the part of the president, on the part of the person who becomes the deputy president. And therefore, in a sense, the constitution is also being tested mm. to see whether it can work. Yes, we are seeing that the constitution can bite. But the constitutional dispensation also assumes that the people, men and women, who are going to occupy those offices are going to exercise self-discipline, which unfortunately is not there. That's why the sorts of things that uh, Professor Pielo is talking about obtain in the country, that His Excellency the President himself will say that no more political meetings, and the following day he will have one himself. No more political meetings, and the next day the Deputy President will have one no more political meetings, the political position will be there. And even we in the media, I keep on saying we in the media because I consider myself to be a member of this fraternity, we will also lament. But the following day we go out and give them glowing coverage. If we were to give uh, Dr. Ruto a blackout, give uh, Mr. Odinga a blackout, Mr. Mdavadi blackout. Even the church, you see them coming out and saying, please obey the protocol. And they receive them, they surrender the pulpit, they greet them with supported hands, they give them the front rows. They are not ordinary uh, uh, worshippers. And the media is there with the cameras. They are beaming sometimes, bringing them to our sitting rooms live. We must ask ourselves where mm. we have fallen short, yeah. all of us. Prof, I see you nodding there. You agree with this? You, you know, you know, are if, we to blame? If, if Barack, uh, and, and you allow me to be a little melodramatic, there is a sense in which while we have a new constitutional dispensation, we came from the Egypt of yesterday, physically, but Egypt is still resident in us. Mm. And this is manifest in the behavior of the political class. Uh, there are individuals who have been in the political class since the 1980s. And it is their stock in trade that they poo poo everything that is said, mm. even when it makes sense. Mm. And we see this on a daily basis with regard to COVID. We see this with the abject abandon with which they conduct their affairs. We see this, and, and, and Barack, you will remember, in the year 2008, through your institution, Mvule, you published a book written by Koigi Wawamwere mm. towards genocide in Kenya, the mm. curse of negative ethnicity. Yeah. It is a book that I commend to every Kenyan at this point in our history. Because what one sees is a political class that doesn't care about the population. It is a population that is zombified and hypnotized by the political class. It is a press that is uh, idolizing. It is uh, a church, particularly the Christian churches uh, that are worshiping Latter-day Baals. And as he said, allow politicians to desecrate the pulpit. And, and there is a sense in which the country has reached a stage where sense does not make sense. It is a country where greed is our creed. And that is a dangerous place to be at. And as we approach the elections, and we must talk about this very early on, you can already see the drums of war being beaten. And there is a sense of deja vu. When I, when I see what is happening in Laikipia, I can remember in 1992 and 1997, it started this way. And then it snowballed. And before we knew it, we were enveloped into a whirlpool from which I dare say we have never recovered. Prof, you know, you're so right. We are so myopic sometimes. We are so myopic. And Dr. Barrett, let me ask you this. It looks like 
that one side of Jubilee is throwing everything at the deputy president. Look at C.S. Matiangi going out in front of a parliamentary committee saying, oh, deputy president, he has most secure, 257 guards. Oh, he has built himself a vast empire. So they're, they're throwing the whole, the kitchen <laughs> sink at him now. Mm, mm. Rafael Tujo a few days later saying, oh, mm, it's mm. great that he's making 1.5 million shillings a day on eggs as he paid his taxes. So it looks like, you know, the gloves are literally off. It is a, a good revelation. And I would want to see more of uh, those kinds of uh, revelatory moments and like activities. Lifestyle audits. lifestyle audits. But I would like to see them across the board. I would like to see and to know who else owns what. I would like to know where they got it. And I would like to know whether they are paying taxes or not. I would like to know who allocates the security detail to each one of these fellows. I don't know, for example, whether the deputy president picks up the phone and uh, uh, summons certain uh, members of the GSU to his residence or to his egg farms. This is a sense in which we lose the plot. And uh, we start uh, actually parroting about the whole thing like popping jays in a manner that uh, clearly indicates we have not reflected about this thing. And even when such a, a very frightful thing like stoning the deputy president's motorcade happens, we start treating it as normal. And when I saw that happening, I got very afraid. I said, the next thing we are likely to see is somebody stoning the president's motorcade. What happens? Are we replaying 1969 again? Do we really know what we are doing? And it starts with the alpha political class up there, the mutual exchanges. Because when you talk about uh, throwing the uh, uh, kitchen wash basin at the deputy president, these basins are actually being flung uh, from all directions. And that's what I mean when I say that we are shipwrecked. And this government has gone beyond its sell-by debt. If there was a po an opposition that could pressurize, it would be telling them to step down, to go home. They have forgotten why Kenyans elected them. They have forgotten what their mandate is. The president who should be in charge as the person who occupies the one institution that symbolizes national unity has himself played the politics of uh, division and once the presidency has collapsed because the presidency has collapsed i can look in that camera and tell the occupants of the presidency that the presidency has collapsed the executive has collapsed there are no cabinet meetings the cabinet is informed with mutual internal suspicion. They ought to step aside. And it's only the opposition which can organize itself and pressurize them either to cohere and do what they are supposed to do or to step aside altogether. And yet the political opposition has lined itself up waiting to be blessed by the president so that it can take over. And that president, instead of going back to his party and telling members of his party that uh, our deputy has become truant, let us find a way, even as a party, of uh, separating ourselves with, from him if they have the ability and the proclivity he goes to the political opposition to tell them to come together. I've never seen anything like that. You know, you know mm. Barack, if, if you permit me, yes. there is a sense in which we could say that under the new political disposition, the tantrums we see now, mm. uh, juvenile adolescent tantrums that may accompany a new political disposition. 
But I think we've been here for long. And, and part of the Kenyan problem, as I see it, and I can't be contradicted on this, is that we have, and I've said this before, that we are in the business, if we want to be metaphorical about it, that we keep on changing the forests to mean political parties, but the monkeys remain the same with their old habits. So you have every election circle, a group of individuals who are the political kingpins migrating, the migratory nature of the Kenyan politician is legendary and without compare in the continent of Africa. So they move from a thing that is called the party A to a thing that is called the party B to a thing that is called the party C. So I think it is insult to the English word political party to describe the contraption that we have in Kenya as political parties. They are vehicles that are crafted periodically and are animated by ethnicization of those contraptions for purposes of competing for political office. When a country finds itself in such a situation, what suffers at the very outset is objectivity. The other thing that suffers is ideas. Julius Nyerere used to put it very well that when a leadership becomes bankrupt of ideas, mm -hmm. then what they do is that they have body shifting things that they call political parties and then they mobilize ethnically and mobilize religiously. And you don't listen. I don't listen to the Kenyan politician when they are on the podium, when they are reading speeches written for them. No. Mm -hmm. Listen to them at the funerals that they attend as a matter of course. Listen to them in the unguarded moments when they speak from their hearts. Mm. And mm. that tells you. Mm. Listen to what is happening, which annoys me to no end and should annoy every Kenyan. Mount Kenya, Nyanza, Western. Nobody talks about Kenya. We are talking about the regionalization, the ethnicization of our agenda. And when they talk about agriculture, they talk about health, they talk about education, it's simply because that is the darn thing in uh, 21st century political discourse. But it is skin deep, it is a thin veneer, it is a moral fig leaf that they use to hide their political nakedness. And this is what we should expose when we have opportunity to do so, and we expose it, Jeff. Because, as they say in Kiswahili, mtego wapanya huingia waliomo na wasio kuemo. We may not be at the center of the politics of it, but when they succeed in messing up this country, it is your children and children's children who will suffer. There is enough history in the region to tell us that. But they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. As I said a little earlier, and I say so ad nauseum, the scales of ambition have clouded their vision. The works of material wealth has blocked their ears. What shall we do? Mm. Prof, real quick, remember the bromance that was between the two? Just matching shirts, matching ties. We, we bought all that in 2013. Was it, was it from the start, was it a miss? Match, you know, was it a... Barack, you will correct me as a student of literature. I do not know who said it. But it was said that in a marriage of convenience, the couples sleep on the same bed, but they have different dreams. Hmm. Permit me to say that it was a marriage of convenience, and the couples each had different dreams. But what is done in darkness, as the good book says, now manifest in broad daylight and we are beholding it to our detriment to our anger this is what is happening mm. we cannot sugarcoat it anymore it is self-evident mm. you agree absolutely yeah. it's the marriage between mark anthony and uh, caesar's uh, sister it's a marriage of uh, convenience the two were never together the two were completely different continents of thought, of uh, vision, self-focused uh, vision, but completely apart. 
and uh, one was using the other one as a horse riding on the back to where he wanted to go and the other one was hoping that he would also ride on this horse in the future but the horse rider having crossed the Rubicon twice decided that uh, it was done and we must ask ourselves the question what is it that is going on in government when uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta uh, His Excellency the President says it is about the baton and instead of him waiting there for the baton he has come for the baton he's saying that whatever it is we are doing in government whatever it is I'm doing in government uh, he wants to be also doing it he's not waiting for the day when I will finish doing it good or bad so that it can become his turn and when I look at uh, this government the thing that I see in this government is graft. And because of graft, we have spent four years focused on an individual, fighting an individual. That is the agenda of government, making the individual an election issue. And I kept saying that if this individual is these things you are saying he is, we must have laws, regulations and procedures of addressing that matter so yeah. that we can put it you know what they say gentlemen there's no honor among thieves among Let's thieves, uh, among, but, among, but, but, among but, thieves. Barack is well, making a point there yeah. which he'll conclude before I interrupt him he was making a point but but this thought came when he talks about having a raft of laws that lends itself to being used to deal with people who are errant because when individuals are errant within a governmental system, they harm the population. And we saw this in South Africa, when it was thought, rightly or wrongly, at a certain stage, that Tabo, Tabo Mbeki was not conducting himself properly. The machinery was deployed yeah. to truncate his tenure. The same we also saw in the case, the, the case of pro, former President Jacob Zuma. Mm -hmm. What we are telling ourselves and what we are being told in this country is that when you occupy political office, you are by that very fact immune from the legal process. And that is a bad thing. It is a bad thing because as I speak to you now, this country is punching below her weight economically, politically and otherwise. And I believe that we'll have occasion to ask ourselves, how can you have a country if you read the newspapers today, a country in which if you read her newspapers today, you would think that we have an election next week. We have elections next week, which tells mm. one story. If I'm an investor, I would postpone my investment decision in this country until the year 2024. Mm. So there would be no employment, which tells an investor that this is not the place to go which means that we are suffering, our agriculture is suffering, which means that our employment and manufacturing sector is suffering. But what do we hear from the political class? Even the clergy, I remember, I was old enough to remember, when if the Catholic Church issued a letter, hmm. the country would come to a standstill. Today, we have individuals who wear the dog's caller who when they cite a politician they tremble and quake in their boots that is how far we have sunk and this has happened because indiscipline has become the culture of this nation democracy presupposes a number of things one the maturity of the masses mm. two a leadership that knows where it wants to take the people and three the discipline as the DNA in running the government. All those ingredients have disappeared without a whimper. Hmm. Gentlemen, I want to take a quick break. This is too much English for me. I mean, this is incredible. This is an interview you're going to be wanting to play over and over and over again. Because when Professor PLO Lumumba shows up, and now Dr. Barack Muluka, listen to him also. No doubt the best political tag team on TV. Gentlemen, when I come back, 
the Uhuru succession. It's the usual suspects. What is, what is that about? And we're here watching like we're on the sidelines of a Shakespearean thingy magic. I'm out of English. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break, Jake and I will be back in a moment. <laughs> wow. What a show, folks. This is a show you're going to want to replay over and over again. When the best political tag team shows up on JK Live, you know they are waxing lyrical. That's right. And I remember the phrase I was thinking of before when I said Shakespearean. It was the theater of the ob absurd. In right? <laughs> Prof, is it absurd? Yes. Yes. Theater of the absurd by Soren Kierkegaard. And Albert Camus. And Albert Camus. Camus. Yes. And Franz, Franz Kafka. Kafka. Those were yeah, the leading thinkers uh, of that UNESCO. generation. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and Prof, we are, uh, we are walking it, it, it into is, this eyes wide and, open, aren't we? Walking you know, into this. You know, there is something that is tragic about this. Tragic in the sense that we are walking with the delicacy of sleepwalkers. Mm. And it is Albert Einstein who famously said that you keep on doing things the same way and you expect a different result, then that is classical stupidity, my words, to make a point that he made. And this is where we are at. And, and when you talked about transition, when you talked about the change, what one expected, particularly when we came up with a new political disposition, is that we would have a process which would be midwifed in a manner that would deliver results which would be informed by the democratic participation of the people. But what has happened in Kenyan politics is that a few individuals who, as I said a little earlier, have succeeded over the years in hypnotizing their ethnic constituencies, have captured Kenyan politics. And there is something that I think has been said times without number. These are politicians who suffer from the Jehovah complex or the God complex. And we are also to blame. We are co-authors of our misfortune. Yeah. We are told if one of our own is the president, then that is our Shangri-La. So that each ethnicity is struggling to produce their own as the president. And it's a cutthroat competition in which throats are actually cut. And we saw throats cut in the year 2007. We saw throats in the year 2017, 2018, and if we are not careful, permit me, and I hope I'm wrong, to do the work of prophets without the gift. If we continue on this trajectory, then what we saw in 2007, 2008, and 2017 may happen again. I pray on a daily basis that I am wrong. But you see, when you see the same individuals, and, and this is part of the tragedy of this country. When I listen to each one of these individuals, and I know them reasonably well in the public agora, telling me that this time round we are going to deliver as we never delivered before, I believe them not. Because I've heard this monotonous sing song for the last two decades. These individuals have been in government, either they served under Daniel Moy, they served under President Kibaki, they are serving under Uhuru Kenyatta, they have had the opportunity to work out the magic that they now say they will work. They'll say we were never president. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If you want to demonstrate to us how good a dancer you are, you show us during the rehearsals. Hmm. And during the rehearsals, we have not seen great dancers. <laughs> but uh, what is it about us? Is it too much democracy? Is it too much education? Is it, are we too free? Because, you know, if you insult the head of state like people do on a daily basis, could you do, can you imagine that in other countries around our region? It, it is sheer irresponsibility, and I want to take it uh, 
right from where he leaves it. He prays and hopes that he's wrong, but I fear that he's right. I fear that uh, he's right because from your idiom of the theater of the absurd, and I've said that before here, it is the Sisyphine curse, the myth of Sisyphus, the individual who is condemned by the gods to keep on pushing this massive rock up the mountain. And each time he gets to the top of the mountain, the angel of mischief kicks and rolls it back to the foot of the mountain. And Sisyphus must go back to the foot of the mountain to push up the rock again, knowing very well that when he gets to the top of the mountain, the angel of mischief will push it down again. Albert Camus concludes that Sisyphus must be presumed to be happy about his circumstances. I don't think that we are overly educated. In fact, we are not. When we were voting in the referendum that gave us what was uh, adjudged, easily the most progressive constitution in the world in 2010, many of us said so and so has read and therefore it's a good constitution. It's an indication that in that uh, zombic existence, we never really got to understand what it was that we were voting for. And today when someone tells us, let us again tinker with it, let us change 74 articles of this constitution, we still come forth and say so and so, the Messiah has said, so we, let us go and do it. And if we are told by somebody else, let us not do it, we also say the Messiah has said, so let us not do it. In terms of education, it is inadequate. Perhaps one of the things we needed to have done was to institute continuous constitutional education from the moment that we promulgated the Constitution on the 27th day of August 2010 we ought to have made it a continuous preoccupation. And perhaps somebody must have thought that uh, IBC would, among other things, be dealing with that. But IBC is within the narrow space of uh, elections and boundaries and things that uh, pertain to democratic institution and constitution of uh, government and transfer of power. We need something much broader that keeps us consciously mm. educated about even government, about this whole notion of democracy. Sometimes we think that democracy is going to the ballot box and casting the vote. Mm. Democracy is broader than that. Democracy is about equal access or equitable <coughs> at the very least mm. access to the opportunities in the country. It's about knowing that the people who go to government do not go there to eat. Uh, PLO uses the expression that they have served. I beg to differ slightly. They have eaten. Mm -hmm. They ate under Kenyatta. They ate under Moi. They ate under Kibaki. In fact, when Kibaki came to power, people were very ostentatious. They said things like, it is our turn to eat. And so when you get there, Jeff, I've sat on this bench and uh, we floated the notion of prebendalism. And some people got uh, mystified by the idiom of pre prebendalism mm. rather than what sits behind it. Prebendalism, that belief that one of the foremost benefits of being in government is the opportunity to make personal gain that is not merited. Mm. That access, it's an opportunity to access the fat of the nation. And a lot of this wrestling that we are seeing in government today is really not about service. It's about who is eating what, who gets which tender, 
uh, how much is uh, looped on, on top of, of that tender and who goes lapping it uh, and, and uh, benefiting with their cronies. It's not about you and I. And so going forward, because we may also lament mm. a little too much. Yeah. Hold that thought, uh, mm. Barack, hold that thought just for a moment. Mm. Because when you look at the Uhuru succession now, Prof, it's the usual suspects. It's the usual suspects. Look at, look at the lineup. Look at the coalitions being formed. <laughs> you know, uh, Jeff, uh, at one time, Barack and I deluded ourselves. We were young and we were young and impressionable and we deluded ourselves <laughs> that we've got to throw our hearts in the arena and we did. I, I, I went with Barack to his rural home in Emanulia mm -hmm. and uh, we walked in the streets of uh, Huisero there and, and uh, he was looking for votes and, and I saw a little child ask him, Barack we want money. <laughs> and I told him. And, and he called me an idiot. He called he said, him an idiot. If you're not giving us money, you're going to lose, <laughs> idiot. So, and and I, 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 I give that example because many are up to say you are in the business of paralyzing yourself through ne unnecessary analysis. You are in the business of criticism. The problem that we have in our politics as it is now and I dare say we will go through at least two more election circles before it goes back to proper factory setting, is that we have individuals who have refused to leave the stage. And this is not only the tragedy of Africa or Kenya, but also the tragedy of Africa. It's the Baganda who said that no matter how good a dancer you are, you Dance must once. know when to mm. leave mm. the stage. Mm. The individuals that you are mentioning, I will not name them because they are known. They danced in 1992, we saw them dance. They danced in 1997, we saw them dance. They danced in 2002, we saw them dance. They danced in 2017, we saw them dance. They are saying they are going to dance even better in the year 2022. I do not believe them, but they'll dance nevertheless. And we, the populace, are also part of the problem. We are co-authors of our own misfortune. Mm. When I see professionals being assembled under ethnic banners, under the glare of the media, Mount Kenya, Cambers, Coast, Luo, Luhias, marginalized groups, then you know that Kenya is an orphan. And to the extent that Kenya is orphaned, it is only those who have received a seal of approval from their ethnicities that can be on the dance floor. They will be there. And as I said at the very beginning, we are between the Scylla and the Charybdis. We can only extricate ourselves if we make the conscious decision to demand more, to ask of the current political class that we are tired. And it can happen in the twinkling of an eye, or it cannot happen. It happened during the Arab Spring, it happened in Sudan, it happened in Mali, and if we are not careful, it could very well happen because I see enough young men and women out there asking the question, the things you are telling us now, do you think that we have the memory of a warthog, that we do not remember that you told us this five years ago, they are asking. When I see the border borders being used and misused across the political divide, are they not asking these questions? So I hear you, Jeff Koinange, musing over your nation as I do. But we, for the moment, find ourselves in these difficult places. 
It started, I remember, as a young graduate, it was Ford. It was Ford Kenya. It was COD. <coughs> it was NASA. It was Jubilee. All these formations, but the contents are the same. The packaging may change to delude you and I, but it remains the same. Yeah. Until the day that we wake up, nothing dramatic is going to happen. But yet, our duty, even in the face of this unfortunate reality, is to keep up our voices alive, even when they will not be heard at their most eloquent. Let history record one day that amidst this gloom, there was a glimmer of fearless statements telling us, proceed not, proceed not. They are the very same. Hmm. Gentlemen, that's deep stuff, deep stuff. In fact, I've, I've just thought of a phrase right now. The more things change, the more they remain the same. Hmm. My goodness. I told you you're going to replay this over and over again. Plus a change, plus a change. The more things change, the more they remain the same. My goodness. Folks, let's take a break. We'll come back plenty more ahead. Don't even touch that dial. So much more ahead. This is the real state of the nation right here on JK Live. Back in a moment. JKO, we're having today. Thank you. Welcome back. We are live with two doctors. That's right. Dr. Barak, he's just informed us, and he is a PhD. <laughs> Good to know. And of course, not Dr. Dr. B. Alone. <laughs> doctor and doctor. No, not informed you, but you know what Achebe says about the lizard Absolutely. and the Iroko tree. Uh, it and, doesn't. And uh, PLO yeah. told me, look, there are all these things which you know and which are very good, but you, you must sort yourself out. <laughs> to become a man of title. <laughs> and you are. You succeeded. Said well done. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, let's, let's face it. Some people say things started falling apart when the handshake happened. Is, is, it, is that a uh, misreading of the equation? No, I, and what happens to Raila Odinga now? You know, in this whole handshake? Jeff, I, I am not one to... There are too many pundits, too many pundits who have given their analysis of this particular issue. But let us look at the context of what is now described as the handshake. What happened at that time is that the country was on tenterhooks. Therefore, the rapprochement perhaps was necessary, but it started on a wrong footing. One would have thought that the leader of the opposition at that time marshaled in his entire troop. But as we now know, even in those early days, they are individuals who are sulking and have continued to sulk to date. So that the entire process started on the wrong footing. And, and when that happened, I think we were applying band aid solutions to a cancerous problem. And when you do that, the cancer festers. The net effect of what we have seen now is that while the handshake so-called was touted as a healing process, another new and bigger wound has appeared. So from my own standpoint, it merely graduated a small wound to an even bigger one. And we can see it because immediately that the handshake took place and postponed the problem rather than solved it, within the government there was conflict that was brewing and now we can see it in its full splendor. And, and the country has been paying for it for the last four years. As Barack said a little earlier, this country has been engaged in 
wars of different intensities and what we have seen is the indiscipline in government what we have seen is the intensification of negative ethnicity what we have seen is uh, the theater of the absurd that you've talked about what we have seen is a preparation for an election four years in advance people mm. have been on a campaign trail since the year 2017 and our economy tomorrow the Treasury will be announcing the rebasing of the Kenyan economy. And they may very well say that our economy is 100 billion GDP a lie. This economy has shrunk and there is evidence everywhere. And I attribute this to the squabbling within government. And that is a tragedy of gigantic proportions. But we also warned ourselves that we don't want to be uh, wallowing in the sea of lamentation without prescribing what it is. Let us now ask ourselves, what have we done as a people? Mm -hmm. What have we done in order to ensure that we set a new agenda? One of the things that makes me most unhappy is the print media in this country. If you read the print media from January now to now, you will discover that the headline has been the same thing for more than 90% of the times. They don't set agenda, as Barack will articulate a little bit more. They don't set agenda. They don't talk about what we ought to do in agriculture. They don't talk about what we ought to do in manufacturing. They don't talk about the thing that we ought to do in the East African region. As I speak to you now, the port of Mombasa is losing out to the port of Dar es Salaam. As I speak to you now, businesses are being set up in Kigali, in Rwanda, and not in Nairobi. As I speak to you now, we are losing the things that were naturally ours. And this is attributable to a leadership that has been gripped by myopia. It is attributable to a leadership that is bent on pursuing political power for its own sake. This is as a result of a political leadership that is dictated by unbridled ambition to the detriment of the people. And it is our duty, therefore, and you who have the honor and privilege of organizing for us such as this, to begin to give the oxygen of publicity to men and women who are going to speak from the Agora and say, no more shall we allow the agenda to be set by people who are fundamentally broken records, whose songs we have heard, whose cacophony of noise we have entertained for the last 24 years. If we do that, something dramatic may happen between now and the month of August. Mm. Who knows? Who knows, uh, Barack, and yet we continue. I mean, the coalitions continue being formed. You hear O1 Kenya Alliance. <laughs> you hear there's a third force. You hear there's, I mean, it's the usual suspects. It's the same individuals. It's a game of uh, musical chairs. They're not saying anything new. They're not saying they want to unite so that uh, we can become what? You hear people saying, I'm the best for president. Make me president but they are not telling you what they will make you after you have made them president. Another one wants to become governor so that you can become what? Another one wants to become senator so that the citizen becomes what? But the citizen is uh, caught up in a, a long night of slumber and it behooves us in certain key and critical institutions to wake up this citizen. That speaking as uh, an African citizen, I'm reminded that uh, there are at least three critical institutions. There's the town crier who we see going around in the night announcing what should happen the next day. The town crier. Mm -hmm. The media is the latter day town crier. And the town crier is held in very high esteem globally. 
to the extent that Cromwell coins the notion of the fourth estate and says, and they more powerful than all the rest. Mm -hmm. Are we using that opportunity to set agenda? Because the town crier is the trailblazer, the bearer of the torch, who must show us the path. And when we get lost, the searchlight must come back to the path and tell us that is where to go. But then we also have the custodians of the shrine and who quite often get lost. And when they get lost, they must also be called back to order by the town criers that they are lost. They have lost direction and the ship and the people with them. The academy is lost. The professors PLO with a profound respect to the academy and the professors and the people of letters and high learning and the philosophers and philosopher kings, they have also queued right there. I'm reminded of uh, Joseph de Graft's famous play, Munto, Munto, where it doesn't matter who you are and what you have achieved, which high skills you, you, great heights you have scaled, you come back to worship this ethnic messiah and you have to place your goods, your letters, and your high learning before this second son of Munto. We need to work ourselves from that slumber. And I've said uh, before, I say it again, certain things must be said repeatedly. The same way we keep hearing about the parable of the sower. Mm. I've heard it I don't know how many times. And when I go to church and read about it, I still listen. Mm. The media has got three roles, three primary roles. The first one is to inform us and inform the people impartially. We say that facts are sacred. And in my communications class, I always say comma, opinion free that comma is important mm. facts are sacred when they are not lest mm. with opinion the moment you less them with opinion they lose their sanctity mm. can we give that information to the people without clouding it with opinion and opinion must describe itself as opinion so that we have the opeds and we are using them for valuable, the valuable purpose of helping the society to move one, two, three more steps in the right direction. But finally, and most critically, is agenda setting. That all these people may do everything that they are doing. And if we think that they are taking the country on the wrong course, we forget about them. We cannot be lamenting about uh, uh, what we are calling the grand super spreaders, but we are following them with our cameras. They know that we are going to follow them with our cameras, and that is exactly what they want. There are people in this country who will not begin a meeting, who will not start reading the document that uh, they have before they have seen these TV cameras. They will serve tea, they give you mandazi, and people will be kept waiting until they see these cameras. Keep away these cameras from these people and take them to more useful things. Mm. That is agenda setting. Tell Kenyans that what we want, the country we want, is a country of such and such a description. And let Kenyans therefore find the leaders that fit in those prisons, regardless of whether they have money or they do not have money. Yeah. Because like uh, Obama said, yes, we can. The pulpit must be redeemed because I think we have got a, 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 a lot of uh, pretenders now owning the pulpits. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, let's discuss going forward. Prof. You know, going forward, what do we need to do? Going forward, I think there are a number of things that we as a nation must do. 
I think this is the point in time that we must go back to the basics. We must ask ourselves what it is that we must do to make Kenya secure. And I say this in the context of what we are seeing in Laikipia. I say this in the context of what we are seeing around the country and the insecurity. And we must therefore ask ourselves, what are the kind of men and women that we are putting in those places? Mm -hmm. We must ask ourselves what we, are, what we are doing in our education sector. What kind of men and women are we putting in those positions? What are we doing about our agriculture now that the president has declared drought to be a national disaster? What are we doing our border, about our borders? What are we doing about unemployment? What are we doing about the businesses that are, have suffered during COVID? What are we doing about our health system that is still weighing, being weighed down by the COVID reality? And when we ask those very practical questions, then we recognize that politics becomes a very important ingredient Mm -hmm. or instrument in solving these things. I always love these opening words in the American Declaration of Independence because they transcend all societies. We hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain alienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. and that it is for this reason that governments are instituted amongst men. Mm. to do certain things and that therefore calls into question how we play our politics right now we have campaigns that are going on full throttle at a time when no seats have been declared vacant I've not had the IBC declaring the office of the president to be vacant I've not the IBC declaring that the governor gubernatorial seats are vacant let us let the country go back and address fundamental issues mm -hmm. when the seats are declared vacant and the campaign period is then set then let us begin to campaign but for the moment we must move in the direction of sanitizing our politics we must move in the direction of ensuring that we re-inject discipline in government president kenyatta is leaving office he's not going to ask anybody for his vote as a citizen of this country what i'm asking of my president the buck stops at you come out address your nation tell your ministers i want discipline tell the opposition and parliament we want discipline instruct your people to do what is in the best interest of the country so that in these last days of his presidency he is remembered as a president who in the midst of a pandemic and difficulties restored discipline as a president who when the country was going awry was able to come back and hold the reins as a president who then midwifed in an impartial way a process which produces a leader whom the people have chosen in a democratic process. That is to the political leadership. To we, the people, and Baraka has talked about the academy, the academy must now rise up. We have over 68 universities. I want to hear Uasu and other bodies beyond speaking about their salaries, talking about the state of the nation. Mm. I want to hear the trade unions talking about the state of the nation. I want to hear the churches and the mosques and mosques and temples talking about the state of the nation. I want to hear the private sector talk about the state of the nation because if the politicians succeed in messing up our country and they are trying very hard to mess it up, all of us will drown. It is now that we can stop them. There is time and it can be done. And history has demonstrated not once, not twice, that the institution of the presidency can do it. Our president, history sits upon his laps, begging him, Mr. President, seize this moment. Mm. How I urge him to seize it. If I could use your Latin words, carpe diem. Carpe diem. How's that? Yeah, but the days are, are ending. Uh, of course, got to 
cut it, chop it off one at a time. But um, His Excellency, the President, is also headed into the lame duck season. And that hiatus that he has is a very short one. It's a very small, limited gap because that window is closing. When you see the defiance within his own fraternity, it's an indication that he doesn't have such a long distance to run. Even the people who have been uh, very staunchly pro BBI from his own uh, backyard, you're seeing they're beginning to hem and haul, that uh, they're starting to engage in double speak, and it's the double speak of uh, migration, pre migration double speak. Such so that if for a moment he just forgot a little bit about this thing of it is so and so, such and such an individual that should succeed me. And focused a lot more on it is this kind of person or it's this kind of country that I want to lay the foundation for. Because he has already lost four years. This past four years have been a wasted season of uh, internecine, intra-jubilee wrangles. You asked about the handshake. I think the handshake was the catalyst uh, where Mr. Odinga found his way into the jubilee ship and uh, he rocked it from within. He had good reason to get on board that ship and rock it because it was a, a hostile Amanda. Uh, he believed that uh, they had stolen his election and when he got there, he must have got there as an unhappy person. I don't know what agreement he reached uh, with the president. He has seemed as if he has been uh, in co-presidency with uh, His Excellency the President. These people are in the habit of reaching certain uh, agreements that uh, we never get to know about in public. We only get to hear about them years later, months later, that there was this agreement which was, was breached and instead focused on the right things. The IBC is one institution that we have not been talking about. The BBI missed it. The BBI said nothing about how to manage elections so that we do not have the kind of, a repeat of the kind of situation that we have had in the past. I have seen that uh, people are baying for Chibukati's blood. And the pattern is exactly the same as it has been in the past. Chibukati might survive or he might go. I don't know. Procurement issues. Some people have even gone to court. They are saying postpone the elections. This is the kind of confusion that the country does not need. But you can see that these are also the preparatory and preliminary stages that eventually mature in rejection of election results and election-related violence. This thing about Chibukati should go, the other two commissioners with him should go, is something to be watched. It is uh, in its puppy stages. It's going to mature into some kind of dogmatism, from puppyism mm -hmm. to dogmatism to electoral violence, the things which must be midwife. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, I think we Magic world, we have some tweets. I'm sure the tweets are coming in. So they can, we can talk about this all day, Absolutely. every day. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with talking. Oh, yeah. it's a slippery yeah. slope we're going down. In the beginning, it, there was the word. The and word. the word was? It was with God. With God. Let's go to the tweets. Let's check out. So many tweets. So think of us. Sir Dam says, do you think Kenya needs a transformative, in brackets, revolutionary leader? Or should we just implement 70% of the current constitution? Barack, real quick. It's the constitution. Just implement it. Yeah. And uh, those who act and speak against the constitution are sleeping in the middle of a revolution. 
Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle. Mm. I agree. That you agree, the, we, 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 we implement the constitution. Or we'll make a few mistakes. The only thing is that we must not persist in our foolishness. We'll make mistakes and we must have the courage to acknowledge and correct them. Mm. And that we can do in an environment of dignity and mutual respect. Absolutely. Mulindi Osome says, so who do we blame? The president, the DP, the opposition? Going to bed with the opposition was the greatest mistake. Call it what you wish. Peace for a country isn't attained in such a way. Prof? My own view is that let us not apportion blame. If you want to apportion blame, then you'll never get anywhere. My view is that we identify the areas in which we have faltered, and it is our duty to all have our hands on deck. Mm. and to ensure that we make demands of leaders. You mm. see that in countries where people have gone, where things have been realized, the population has made demands of their leaders, and the leaders are then sensitive to those demands. That is what we must do. All hands on deck, I agree. Tony Manyara says, tribalism in Kenya is responsible for underdevelopment, corruption, rigging of elections, and violence. What can its background tell us about the future risks of Kenyan tribalism and how to put it to an end? How do we do that, Barack? How do we put an end to tribalism? It's a, a, a social construction. I don't have uh, any problems with uh, people from other tribes Absolutely. In, the, in the country. Nobody from other tribes uh, has a problem with me. And I have not seen ordinary Kenyans having challenges with uh, one another. It is that clique at the top which has created that uh, particular uh, construction, social construction, for its own benefit. Yeah. You know, the tribe is something that is manufactured and uh, tribalism is used by the selfish and myopic politician for short-term political gains. Otherwise, unity in diversity is our strength as a people. Mm. That is the way we should do it. Do about it. Yeah. Do we, do we have to reset our brain? Is that what we're going to have to do? Just reset? This kind of engagement that we are in is, is part of the education. You can, uh, somebody is asking, we talk about yeah. the CBC and the new curriculum. Right. One of the things that I have a problem with in this country is mm. that we have stated in our constitution and in the instruments within the region that we are working towards an East African integration. And we said it at the very beginning yeah. that if you want to integ integrate, one of the things you want to do is to harmonize your education system. In the last 25 years, Years. We have changed our education. We migrated from the old system into the 844. I've not been told why we did. We now have CBC, and the region is not doing the same. We've got to behave as if we want to be part of East Africa so that we have migration of labor. Mm. In my view, mm. CBC is something that we should interrogate within the context of the region because labor that is only useful within Kenya is not the kind of labor that we want. I want labor to be, to, to be, to be agile and to be acceptable within the region and beyond. And we are implementing things. Look at CBC and what it needs and look at the kind of schools that we have in rural Kenya, half of which do not even have electricity and other things. We've got to question these things. This idea by people who are in policy making position that they have the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom is misguided. It is the shortest avenue to chaos and confusion and CBC must be interrogated. If you talk to professionals, they'll tell you that those in policy-making decisions simply rammed it down their throats and they were told this is the way to go. Mm. Now we are learning on the go. Not good. Mm. Not mm. good. Thomas Masotti is asking, would mm. any of them dare run for presidency? If yes, what would be any three changes they would champion for? Brock? Three things. Uh, first of if all, you were to run. first of all, this country doesn't uh, vote for people like me, and therefore I would not uh, offer myself for uh, electoral politics. Meaning, meaning what? Intellectual. <laughs> <or>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people yeah, like you just understand people people like myself yeah. people who are independent minded because to be elected in this country you must first of all identify a demigod you must kneel and prostrate yourself before that demigod and sometimes you must take your way a withal before that demigod and you must even 
send messages to editors in media houses like this one and tell them that uh, if you joke with the so and so, we are going to sort you out. I'm sure you are familiar with those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I have got neither the ability nor the proclivity to worship a human demigod. I only worship God. So a country like this one does not uh, elect people like uh, myself. Prof, I'm not, no, I'm not, my own view is that Prof, they are, when, when you I'm want to be the president of a young nation such as this, you've got to deal with the soft issues first. And part of the problem, one of the issues that we must fix is the nature of our politics. And I think that the architecture of our politics will require, among other things, that we have institutions that are functioning, that are capable of serving the people at the grassroots, number one. Number two, you want to deal with mobilization of resources. Because when you, once you have sanitized your poor politics and you have mobilized resources, then you have the ability to implement the agenda that you put on the table, whether it's in agriculture, it's in education, in health, and those other areas. And number three, the human resource. Who are the kind of individuals that you want to be deployed to preside over these things? I was talking to my friend Ole Kina, and he was telling me that just this afternoon they have brought in a bill requiring that people who want to contest certain offices must have university degrees. Not that degrees make people to be better, but the possession of knowledge and exposure is a good thing because it enables you to understand the sophistications of governance in the 21st century. I believe that if we do all those things, deal with human resources, create an enabling political environment and utilize our resources in a proper manner, then we will achieve what governments are meant to do, to improve the quality of the lives of the people and to unlock their potential. Yeah. The pursuit and, and, of and, and that picture of, 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 of where you want the country to be, mm. It must be the beginning point that uh, in another 50 years, 100 years, this is the kind of country that we want to have. And to get to that uh, model country that we want 50 years from now, this is the human resource that we need. And therefore, harmonize training with labor. We are training people whom we don't know what we want to do with. Hence, Graduates will come out of uh, various institutions and then they start loafing around. They border border. <laughs> there is a nagging question traffic. there which you must speak mm. to even mm. as you to Barack, kindly ask the lingual duo about the entry of Musalia Kalons and the likes of Muturian Jimmy Wanjigi to 2022 presidential contest. Uh, gentlemen? It's a good thing. Uh, I think eventually I would desire a situation where they all run. I would desire to see a situation where there's no clear winner. Instead of uh, them haggling all the time about I'm the best, you must support me. And then let the Wanainchi voters nominate the last two people who get to the wire. No, the individuals have the right to offer themselves for election. I do not begrudge them. Mm -hmm. In my view, uh, I've seen enough of them in the last 10 years. Uh, if I was asked to vote for any one of the individuals that are named there, I would be very slow <laughs> to vote for them. Because <laughs> I would be very slow because I've seen them serve <laughs> as cabinet ministers. I've seen them serve in different capacity in the government. And, and they do not inspire my confidence. But people are capable of changing if they change and they are capable of demonstrating that they, they can deliver, then, then it is the duty of Kenyans to consider, to weigh them on the scale, and if they find them worthy, to then give them the opportunity to serve. But one of the things that I've realized is that the ballot box is not a magic uh, box that converts people suddenly. <laughs> so, so that is the caveat that I would put on the, pay on, on, on the table. And I see somebody wants us to talk about the BBI, mm. it's sub judice mm. So there is a sense in which we must be very slow to look at the merits of it. But I want to say something without offending the rule of sub judice that the, there is no constitution in the world that does not lend itself to amendment at any one time in its life. 
The only thing that I want to say, and this is a view that I've articulated before, is that the BBI, as it was conceived and marketed, was dead on arrival. It was a process that was not commenced in accordance with the Constitution, and I'm now happy that the High Court has made that finding, and the Court of Appeal has made that finding, and those who have aggrieved have found it fit to go to the higher court, let us wait for the higher court to pronounce itself on that issue. And once they have, we shall then have the occasion to unpack the judgment that will be delivered. Part of the discipline that I'm talking about is to recognize the rule of sub judice. Yes, and uh, an opinion nonetheless is uh, important and uh, critical, especially about the so-called eternal clauses those which we cannot amend and i've seen that that's one of the reasons we are going to the supreme court mm -hmm. i want to believe that uh, the constitution of kenya has clauses that are eternal that cannot be amended uh, for example we can't say that uh, we want to amend the constitution so that uh, we become a monarchy a constitutional monarchy our constitution says that we are a uh, a, 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 a republican um, institution, a republican entity. We are a constitutional uh, uh, democracy. And if you're going to say, let us change, let us amend, so that uh, maybe we now have a, a monarchical uh, system of government, uh, I think that would be a very retrogressive kind of... We will of reserve that debate. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that there are eternal clauses, but I believe that there are certain basic structure issues. But we'll debate that a little bit more <laughs> elaborately. Elaborately, let's come back. All right, gentlemen, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> closing thoughts. Let's get some closing thoughts. Barack, let's start with you. Uh, closing thoughts going forward. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we are in a very delicate uh, moment. And uh, my plea would go to the alpha political class, as I call it, that uh, it needs to slow down. If it doesn't slow down, it's going to take this country down to the abyss. Because the things that they are saying to one another, the things that we are seeing them do, we begin seeing them percolating downwards. And as they cascade downwards, they start getting to their less sophisticated supporters. And you start seeing the kinds of things that we witnessed uh, over the weekend. The stoning of uh, the deputy president's uh, motorcade. I think it's completely unacceptable. They started experimenting with stoning the former prime minister's motorcade somewhere in Kasarani. They got away with it. They have become bolder. They have stoned the deputy president. They have gotten away with it. I'm very worried that the next thing we are going to see is somebody actually being foolish enough to attempt to stone the presidential motorcade. I've seen an individual even uh, disrupt the presidential motorcade uh, mm -hmm. only earlier this year. Certain institutions are sacrosanct. It doesn't matter whether you like the individual who is there or not, whether you agree with them or not, whether you like President Kenyatta or not, Deputy President Ruto or not, whether you like uh, Raila Odinga or not. Give them that space. Let us have conversations of this kind. Let us agree to disagree, but let us not take that route. Absolutely. Prof, you get the last word. But my view is that we must sanitize our politics. We must introduce discipline in our politics. We must tell the politicians that they are exposing this country to grave danger. And we should ask constitutional institutions that have been created to begin playing their function. The National Commission on Cohesion I want to hear their voice about the ethnic venom that is being spewed around. The Commission for Human Rights, I want to hear their voices. 
the churches and the mosques and all Kenyans of goodwill. This is the time to remind the political class that if we continue on this trajectory, then we are exposing our country to mortal danger. To the population, don't allow yourself to be manipulated by your ethnic kingpins. If one is from your tribe and they become president, they'll not become president of your tribe. They'll become the president of the Republic of Kenya. What we want is service delivery. And to the president of the Republic of Kenya, history is beckoning. In the month of August, after the ninth day of August, a week from that, you will not be the president of this country. Historians will be looking back and they will ask, when you had the chance, did you secure the country? We are asking you, move now and say what other leaders have said before. The buck stops with you and Kenyans of goodwill will support you in that quest. And to the politicians, lastly, during this COVID, please just respect people's lives. You love votes. You will need their votes. Don't expose them to premature death through your recklessness hmm. and unbridled ambition. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I could talk about this every single day, and it's great that you guys can. Thank you for coming all the way from Emanuelia. Please greet the Emanuelians uh, when you I'm, go back. I'm, I'm going back tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Barack will look a PhD. <laughs> Yes. The, thanks the, 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 to the, the, the lizard that jumped the from lizard. the great Iroko tree. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you, for your time. Thank you very we much. Really appreciate God it. This is a conversation you. we need to keep having over and over again. There's nothing wrong with keep having this conversation, folks. Because like I say, let's keep talking. Because the moment we stop talking, is the moment fighting. we stop fighting. And Absolutely. You do not want to go down that slippery slope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Don't forget, Jeff Kennedy Live is powered by Johnny Walker. You know, Johnny Walker exhibiting electrifying quality and celebrating 200 years of blended Scotch excellence. And JK Live also powered by Standard Chartered Bank. At Standard Chartered Bank, priority banking, your well-being becomes their priority. Thanks so much for joining us, folks. Again, spread the word about this particular show played over and over and over again. Thank you all. Good night. You. Good luck. God Thank bless you. you all. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you.